Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is cartoonist John Hambrock, who is the mind behind, the brilliant mind of Edison Lee. John, welcome to Comic Culture. Hey, thanks. I'm glad to be here. So what can you tell us about the brilliant mind of Edison Lee? Where I guess you're, you're approaching your 10th anniversary. You've got a, yes. a strip in the newspapers. Uh, so sort of what was the inspiration? How did you get to where you are today? Well, you know, I started doing comic strips, uh, geez, 25 years ago, um, trying different things. Um, the Edison comic actually is based on loosely on my oldest son, who's now an engineer. Uh, he was a very, very bright child. And uh, he used to like to create things. And of course, I'm an artist. So an artist and an engineer uh, sort of have parallel lines. But, but he's very analytical and mathematical. And I'm very artistic and free. And I didn't really do a whole lot with him as a child. Uh, but I mean, as far as creating inventions and things like that. But as he got older, I watched him grow. And I thought, wouldn't that be fun to make a comic about a kid who likes to invent and create? And so that's really where Edison got started. Uh, but it wasn't turned into a strip for years, years later. And as I recall, I think I was reading on your website, uh, edisonlee.net, uh, you were in advertising for a number of years and you sort of took the Keebler route to oh, yeah. becoming a professional cartoonist. Yeah, well, I'll tell you the story real quick on that. Uh, I remember this meeting very, very well. My, my, the, the, the boss came in one morning and said, we, we landed the Keebler account and we looked around and he uh, wanted to know who could draw cartoons. And of course, nobody really had any cartoon experience in my agency where I was. So I raised my hand, you know, thinking foolishly that I could do it. And uh, so I started working with the Keebler Elves and uh, worked with them for five, six, seven years as far as I remember. Um, they're very particular about how they draw those elves. So it was a learning experience. And I, I, at that point I realized, because growing up I didn't draw cartoons, I didn't draw superheroes, I didn't draw even you know Peanuts or Charlie Brown. I didn't really look at comics as anything I wanted to do. It was working with these elves though that I sort of realized I like the line, I like the characters. Uh, and it was at that point that I started seriously considering doing a comic strip. That and my wife kind of uh, put that seed in my mind as well, because she's a big comics fan, and she thought I would be very good at doing a comic strip. Uh, and Edison Lee, um, it, it has a look to me that uh, is very reminiscent of Bill Watterson's uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, there is that sort of whimsy in the line, and. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, any of your inspirations that uh, when you were reading the, the newspaper funnies, uh, any creators that really, you know, you can look back and say, oh, you know, I, I kind of took that from them or that kind of pushed me in this direction with, uh, with a story or, a, or maybe a piece of art or something like that? I say, you know, a lot of them. Yes, there's, uh, we all love Calvin and Hobbes and, and I used to get, uh, people would get upset you know, when it first launched that they thought it was, you know, it's a boy comic strip, you know, how dare you tread on Calvin ground. And, and I try very, very hard not to do anything that would even appear to be uh, building on the, the, the back of, of Bill Watterson and Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, I like a lot of the older stuff. Um, uh, probably, well, I shouldn't say too old. Uh, Charlie Brown and Peanuts was was probably one of my biggest influence because of the simple line and all that. Of course, I like Bloom County. I read uh, and um, Gary Trudeau, of course, is a big hero of mine. So I kind of look at a bunch of different comics, and I'm sure a lot of those have seeped into my work. But you know, I try very, very hard to keep it my own voice and my own image and uh, keep the strip pretty much my own creation. Now, of course, when I say Calvin and Hobbes, I don't mean that in a, in a derisive way. Obviously, that was a brilliant strip. And I think no. what I mean is that, that there's just a similarity in that, that sense of whimsy that, that the lines seem to have, the way the characters interact. I think around Thanksgiving, you had a story where uh, uh, the grandfather is uh, dressed up like a turkey and gets swept away for uh, a few weeks. Uh, until he's finally, I think, down by some power lines or something. Now he's got to get, get his way back home, um, and that's the, the sort of 
you know, uh, trouble that, that a character like Calvin would get into, or uh, we might see uh, Charles M. Schultz uh, taking, you know, Charlie Brown on a two-week adventure uh, to camp or something like that. Uh, and you can, you can see those influences, and it does have that unique quality to it. Um, so let's, let's talk about the characters a little bit, because Edison is, of course, the, the boy genius. Um, and then he's got his family, his mother, his father, and his grandfather, and his uh, lab rat sidekick, Jules, uh, which is, I was reading today's strip, and I, I think the Pop-Tart in the middle of a maze is a great way to get anyone <laughs> to do some work for you. Um, so how did the characters, how did they start out and how did they get to where they are? And, and I'm assuming there's been some evolution uh, in the way that you present the story, but in the way that the characters have evolved that now they're telling the story to you. I'll be real quick about the evolution of the strip from where it began before it was even picked up by King. Um, Edison was just a comic about a boy genius and I had pitched it to the syndicates and it really didn't get anywhere. Uh, this was around 1998, 99. Uh, we had the 2000 election and everything falling to pieces as far as, you know, the hanging chads, all that stuff, if you remember. And so I started looking at politics and, and with a very keen eye and, and it started to work its way into my writing for Edison. But here's a boy who likes to invent, yet there's this political edge to it as well and a social edge. So that's kind of where it all sort of came together. And when I started doing that, that was my truest voice. Uh, it woke up, you know, the syndicates, they looked at it more carefully. And of course, King Features uh, saw it as um, something that they wanted to, to pick up. So that's how it actually got. If I hadn't put that political edge into it, it never would have uh, taken off. But very early on, it was very very uh the writing was stiff i felt you know it lacked i never would have done the you know the, the grandfather dressed up as a turkey and flying off on a balloon uh 10 years ago but i can do that now um so as far as the evolution of the strip it's become more free i just throw stuff out there that's silly i like to be very very silly and i think that is uh what I find most appealing about doing it is just throwing all that silliness out there and, and, and seeing where it leads. When I started writing, you mentioned that series with the turkey. When I started writing that series, uh, I had no idea where it was going to wind up. I mean, that's a two and a half week series, I believe. And you can look at, if you're a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy sort of a, a fan, you can kind of look at it like that. They never knew week to week where it was going to wind up or where it was going to go. And that's, I think, the freshness of that um, is, is what makes it appealing to me anyway. So when you sit down and you, you've got to put the strip together, um, mm -hmm. are you thinking in terms of, uh, I'm just going to put together a bunch of ideas and then sketch it out, or is it I'm just going to start drawing on the board and see where it goes? Or uh, is it just something where you let the ideas take you, or do you sit down and say, oh, I've got this idea, I'll write down a note, and I'll go back to it later on, flesh it out? All of the above. <laughs> You know, the the great Richard Thompson, if you're familiar with his work with cul-de-sac, Richard, I know, could sit down at his board and just draw, and a comic strip would emerge. I can't do that. I can't just start drawing from the left, and by the time I get done with the right, I've got a comic. I have to write it first. Uh, it used to be, a long time ago, I used to write comic ideas on bank statements and gum wrappers, whatever I could find. If I'm in the car at a stoplight and I need something to write on, I'd grab whatever I could find. Uh, so I like to write first. I do sit down uh, each week and I try to write all seven comics and then I'll sit down. And as I'm writing, I'm storyboarding in my head. I have a very, very clear vision when I'm writing of what Edison is doing in each panel, what's going on around him, what the scene looks like. So I make little cues in my writing, you know, he's going to be doing this or he's going to be standing here. And then I take those scripts and I work up the, the final. I do pencils first before I actually ink. I can't just take my brush and ink and st st start. I, I, I'm not there yet. Maybe in 25 more years I can do that. <laughs> uh, so you're, you're using a, a brush for inking. Yes, I use a sable brush and a bottle of uh, speedball ink. How high tech is that? Well, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> there, there's something magical about the line that comes yeah. from a brush as opposed to a pen. It's so free, you know? 
Um, and when you do go back, I started uh, drawing recently and I, I went to the Copic markers and I'm trying to use the brush marker and it just doesn't have the same feel as you know, a, a nice Winsor Newton uh, may have or something. But I just can't get ink as dark as I used to be able to get, it seems. Um, well, a speedball ink, it's, that's what I, it's the darkest, blackest ink that I could find. I tried a brush pen one time for three or four months and I couldn't get the really super fine line that I wanted. Right. And when we take a look at, uh, at Edison, we, we see that there is, uh, there's a variation of that line and it, it gives that, I guess the style matches the writing uh, is the most succinct way I could put it. Um, so is this something that's just kind of it's your personality coming out both visually and as we read through the, the balloons or is this a conscious effort you had to kind of create this, this sort of look? Not a conscious effort. It's interesting. I, every week I look at what I've done and I think, wow, where did, where did that come from? I really have no idea. Uh, it's funny how things evolve, how you evolve. I still marvel when I look at something that I've drawn. I think, wow, you know, I drew that. I like that. I'm happy with that. Where did that come from? Um, you just get good when you've done, you know, I've done 3,000 500 something comic strips you you can't help but be good what is the what is this they say 12,000 hours and you're a professional at something you know <laughs> well I think that's that's kind of where I am did I ask your question I hope <laughs> well absolutely um, okay. the, the other question I would ask is um, you spend part of your week writing down the the ideas you spent part of your week sort of uh, penciling and inking so in a given week are you at the the office 40 hours, 50 hours, 10 hours. Uh, how long does your process take you? I probably put 40 hours in on the strip. You know, and it could be uh, get them all done on a Tuesday or a Thursday or a Friday. You know, you get up and you, you hope when you start the process all over, when you turn everything into the syndicate and you go, okay, I got to sit down, start all over again. Um, you hope that you can find a germ of an idea. And it's interesting because when early on, you don't know what you're going to say. But, and I tell this to people a lot. I say the characters write themselves now at this point. When I get up, if I want to think, well, what's Grandpa going to say? What's Orville going to say today? All I have to do is just pop him into my head, you know, look around and see funny things. And, and he says what he needs to say uh, pretty much... Uh, without a lot of thought anymore he just it's there you you when you work with these characters for so long they they pretty much write themselves for themselves and you uh, you're dealing with a, a syndication company uh, how many newspapers is edison lee in uh, digital and print that varies you know a hundred to ten hundred and ten maybe uh, digital numbers, I don't know what those are. Those could be up in the three, four, five hundred. You know, a lot of papers are carrying digital and print. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are just print. Print is harder to grab a hold of and keep, it seems like, these days. Most of my print newspapers, I've got some big markets. Most of them have kept me on since the day it was launched 10 years ago. Um, so uh, growth is hard, uh, I think, in this market. But it's still happening. I mean, we picked up a couple new markets in the last five months, maybe six months. So, and um, when it comes to the digital uh, distribution, mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming uh, it's easier for newspapers because they don't have to go through the print costs and everything. Yeah. Um, and the, the syndicator, I guess, is taking care of the, the financial end. And I, I don't mean to pry into numbers or anything like that, but. Um, when you're looking at this new means of distribution, is, is that something that can continue to grow or is that something that maybe has is, is reached that, that saturation point, sort of like the print medium? There's room to grow. All the syndicates are trying to figure this out and they're still working on it. It's, uh, I see the numbers creep up a little bit every month, you know, not much, but there is growth. There, there, to try to monetize the internet is, is very difficult and, and um, it's not what it is for print, certainly not. You know, if we had to rely solely on digital uh, income for a comic, I think uh, we'd all have three and four jobs. <laughs> you know, you really need that revenue from the newspapers to, I think, to really boost uh, any financial um, gain you have with it. All right, well, 
I'd like to move back to some of the, the more the fun part, uh, the, mm -hmm. the stories. You, you just wrapped up, a, a, I think it was about a two week uh, story about Edison combining the technology from Star Trek and oh, Star yes. Wars. And then we find out at the end that, that Darth Vader is Donald Trump. Yes. Um, <laughs> then we have the politics in there again, see? So I'm, I'm imagining that you are a, sort of a, a pop culture junkie, uh, maybe a little bit of a, a lean with your interest in science towards that science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so how does a story like that come to you? Is it just something where you're like, I wonder if dot, 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 or is this a conscious effort to sort of mash those two worlds together because you know that it's going to you know, rub somebody the wrong way, it'll tickle somebody over here, and then the Donald Trump thing is going to be topical? <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> you know, well, it's interesting. My wife and I, we, we talk a lot about just stuff in general. And a lot of times, and th that particular series may have come out of a conversation that we had, uh, or it may have even been her idea. You know, she comes up with a lot of great ideas and throws them my way and says, what do you think about this? And I go, oh, that's great. As far as the Star Trek, Star Wars, that kind of thing, I like to do Star Trek stuff, and I thought, what a great way to just kind of mash it all up and, and see where it leads. And again, I had no idea when I started writing that Donald Trump was going to be Darth Vader at the end. I really didn't know. That just one well, of those things where as you go along, it sort of um, grows and, and takes on a life of its own. And pretty soon you have that, uh, that whole series. It was a fun series. Um, yes, I am sort of a science fiction geek. Uh, I don't watch a lot of the uh, popular stuff on cable or anything like that. So I'm a little behind the curve as far mm -hmm. as what's going on with The Bachelor or all these other <laughs> shows that, you know, that are happening. I just don't watch that. Well, I will point out that we do have William Shatner on the set with us, who is uh, sort of keeping me honest every, every show. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to talk because I've been mentioning a lot of the, the serialized stories, the ones that go on for a week or two, but a lot of what Edison Lee is about is sort of that gag a day. Um, yeah. And... Uh, how do you, I mean, looking at the gag a day stuff, trying to come up with a funny joke every day, um, what is it about the world that, that gives you that sense of, I can turn this into something people will relate to and people will get a smile from, if not a, you know, an outright laugh? Well, you, you, you hit something there. You know, people have to be able to relate to it. Uh, the comic strip zits, if you're familiar with that. That strip resonates with everybody because they can all relate to it. Uh, I try to make my, my, my one-off strips, my gag day strips, uh, topical a lot of times, uh, where people can understand it, but I don't want to anger anybody. I'm not trying to, to uh, you know, poke barbs at anybody. I really, that's the last thing I want to do, but I want to make people think. Um, those are harder to do, those one-off strips. If I sit down a week and I know I have to write seven, six or seven individual gag strips, for me that's harder than doing just a series, because uh, the series kind of leads you through it, um, and you can sort of write all seven of them in your head at the same time. Yeah, and within the, the larger story, there are those peaks and valleys mm -hmm. that just go with, you know, mm -hmm. leading a character this way or that way. Um, so I'm imagining that hitting a note here or there is easier than within three pa uh, pages, or panels rather, three pages, three panels to be able to, to have a setup uh, and then a, a, a deliver a solid punchline. There's, a, there's a, an element of uh, sort of that Monty Python um, silliness in a lot of the, the stuff that you do. And I'm just wondering, uh, outside of, of comics, what are the sort of influential uh, funny things that when you look back at, you know, maybe uh, that's, you can see that kind of seeping its way into your work? Well, definitely Monty Python, absolutely. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, of course. Um, silliness, Green Acres, okay? I, a lot of my characters, especially my older characters, are, it's like a Green Acres show, okay? They're just, they're out there on one plane living in this sort of surreal existence, doing these odd, weird things, and then Edison is sort of the go-between between, between his parents and sane people and then the rest of the world who are kind of these crazy outsiders that, that sort of inhabit his world. Uh, so I would say those are really big. You know, I love comedy, anything funny. I always try to make my strips, If I always try to make myself laugh in every one of them, even the strips in the serial that I do. Uh, I try to make each one of them funny in some way and not just a, a bridge in a story arc to carry the next day. 
Well, it's funny um, because you do a lot uh, of strips where uh, the grandfather is going to a fast food restaurant. Um, and we've all had experiences with customer service. And I'm just wondering, based on the, the number of strips that take place in, a, in the fast food restaurants, do you have a background in the, the food industry? And, <laughs> or are you just a fan of you know, the McDLT? I don't have any background <laughs> in fast food. It's, it's, you know, I think my first strip came for, it's the Jolly Burgers, what it is, and those are, I got to tell you, those are the easiest to write. If I'm stuck, I need a strip for a week, all I got to do is think, okay, we're going to take Grandpa to the Jolly Burger, and I can come up with something. But going way, way back, my kids were young. I took them to McDonald's one night for dinner, and something happened. There was a, uh, like a manager that really messed up all across the board with the order, with how she handled it and all that. And I think I went home and wrote my first Jolly Burger strip after that incident. And there, there, it's the low hanging fruit. I just <laughs> have to, I can go there as often as what, I can't go there too often because I'll, you know, people will get tired of it, but uh, no, but I have no background in any <laughs> fast food. Because uh, I know that the comic strip retail uh, is one of those ones that when I look at, uh, it's in the same paper uh, as uh, The Brilliant Mind of Edison Lee. And that's one of those ones where you can tell that the cartoonist has spent a lot of time in retail to get a lot of those stories because it's, it's a little too on point. So I was just checking because I think we've all had that odd customer service experience. Mm -hmm. I went to a diner once. I asked, you know, how was the pie? And the woman looked at me and said, terrible. And I thought that was both the most honest and the funniest <laughs> thing a, a waitress has ever said to me. Um, now, I, I noticed that you have some strips behind you on the, on the wall. Uh, yes. And are these your own strips, or are these uh, some of the creators that you are a fan of? My whole studio is full of comic art. I've got probably 100 plus pieces. We all, we all trade uh, our original comics uh, together. I think behind me here is um, Sandra Bell Lundy, who does Between Friends. She's very, very talented. She's one of my favorites. Um, a strip that used to run called uh, Ollie and Quentin was with Clean Features for about four years. Uh, it was a great strip, pantomime, uh, not pantomime, but um, great strip. Mm -hmm. uh, so we trade, you know, we trade back and forth, and I keep them, most cartoonists, you will see a, a picture in their studio, they'll have comic art all over the walls. It's just fun to, to, to collect them and have them as inspiration. You look at them and go, gosh, I, I'd love to draw like that someday. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting, when I was younger, I remember watching Jack Lemmon in uh, How to Murder Your Wife. And uh, I'm guessing with, with the way things are going uh, with newspapers, that, that cartoonists aren't living that sort of uh, celebrity lifestyle anymore. Um, are you able to walk down the streets of Kenosha without uh, getting mobbed? Oh, absolutely. I, <laughs> I can't remember the last time I got mobbed. Let's see. <laughs> um, there is a certain celebrity status. I mean, people do know who you are uh, just because you appear in the paper every day. Um, but no, it's not like it was back in the, the 50s and the 60s, the heyday, you know, the Mort Walker. Th those guys got invited to the White House for crying out loud, you know. I mean, it was a big, big deal. Uh, it's not that anymore. And that's, I think most of us shy away from that sort of, we're, we're not looking for the spotlight. We really don't. Uh, seek it out. We love to have our work, our voices heard, but I don't think we like to put our faces on it. And I'm speaking for me. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe there are a lot of them that do, but you know, if I if I did, I'd go out and be a stand-up comic. Maybe <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it seems like uh, that there is sort of a fraternity uh, between cartoonists. Um, is this something where you you just you know uh, speak to each other via email, or is this something where you? you actually meet at uh, conventions or, or perhaps at the you know, King Features or something like that where you're, uh, you're actually meeting face to face in order to well, form these relationships? You know, we have our annual, every year we have our annual Rubin Awards weekend. Uh, it's every we year over Memorial Day. And this year it's gonna be in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we always pick a new city East Coast, West Coast, Middle, wherever, and we all get, it's four days of just nothing but cartoonists. The hotel staff, they usually love us, <laughs> you know, because uh, they get it, you know, you don't want a, a, a convention of um, briefcase salesmen. Who's more fun? <laughs> a bunch of cartoonists or, or you know. Um, so yeah, we, most of us, we, we all kind of know each other. A lot of us work together on different projects. Um, 
and uh, there are very few cartoonists that are working today that I do not know personally. No, you know, we just. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But no, I, that's okay, go ahead. I was going to say, we just have a, a few moments left uh, uh -huh. of our show. I just wanted to find out um, the size of the, the board that you're working on. I know if I were working in a comic book, I'd probably be working in a, a 10 by 15 space. So when you're putting together your strips, what, what size boards are you working on and, and how big is the original art? My original art, I work on eight and a half by 17 inch panels. And um, that's how big I work. That's about the average for most. Uh, some cartoonists work very, very small. Some work big. I've seen some original Charlie Brown comics, and they're huge. I mean, Charlie Schultz likes to work gigantic. I don't know where he got all his paper, but <laughs> uh, I just take an 11 by 17 sheet, and I cut it in half is what I do, and I work with that. And I guess the other question is your, your work is reduced, and, and as newspapers are running out of space, they're kind of squeezing them down, squeezing them down. Yeah. So how do you balance spotting the blacks, putting the, the, the shadows in the right spot with readability that's a real challenge uh, because it's interesting a lot of papers squish you know they'll they'll adjust the scale of a comic so in some papers it'll be squashed horizontally it'll be squashed vertically uh, it's very very hard it's discouraging actually because they are getting so small and a lot of the line quality that I used to put into my strip I don't do anymore because it just gets to the point where no one's gonna really see it uh, and, and color, too. I, I like black and white comics more than I like the color dailies, but that's just a personal preference of mine. Well, my newspaper, my local newspaper, the Laurenburg Exchange, uh, they print their comics in black and white, which is how I used to read comics as a kid. And um, I think that's, that's, it adds something to the artwork because you're, you're kind of forced to put yourself more into it. Uh, and I always thought of the Sunday paper as the, the one that you should see in color, but maybe that's exactly. just a personal preference. Um, well, I see that we have about 30 seconds left. Uh, John, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us on Comic Culture today. Uh, if anyone wants to get more information on the brilliant mind of Edison Lee, you can go to edisonlee.net. John, thank you so much, and thank you for watching Comic Culture. We'll see you again soon.